Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here, and I'm really very excited to uh, speak to all of you about quantum computing, a uh, subject that I've worked on for almost 20 years now uh, with, with great enthusiasm. And um, when you look at the uh, history of computation, I think we will all agree that there is an enormous progress starting from the abacus a few, a few thousand years ago to supercomputers uh, today. Um, and you know, computational power continues to advance rapidly, driven by Moore's law, parallel computing, uh, novel architectures, and so forth. So in a sense, you would say that, you know, really there is no comparison between the abacus and a modern supercomputer. But from a physics point of view, we observe that both machines obey the classical laws of physics. Newton's laws, Maxwell's equations, and in the case of classical systems, they are necessarily in well-defined states. So when we encode a bit in the voltage on the capacitor, that bit has to be either zero or one, a well-defined state. Um, but ultimately, the world around us is quantum mechanical. And in quantum systems, or in the quantum world, um, an electron, for instance, can be in more than one place at the same time. And you can even see this in electronic devices. At low temperature, electrons can flow through the two arms of that ring simultaneously, and every electron, as a result, interferes with itself. So this led the great physicist Richard Feynman to ask the question whether in doing computation the way we've always done, we have really exhausted all the possibilities of computational power, the possibilities that nature has to offer. He asked the question, couldn't it be the case that if we build machines, computers, based on quantum rules, that we can compute in a fundamentally different way and much faster than is possible with any machine today? So this notion really got traction in the mid-90s when the first algorithms, the first applications were discovered for taking advantage of these quantum properties for speeding up computation. And in fact, there was, this also sparked early interest at ISCCC. Um, 19 years ago, here in San Francisco, I uh, co-authored a paper where we described how to use the spins of atomic nuclei in a molecule to build simple quantum processors. And so in this talk, I would like to tell you the story of quantum computing beginning with the key concepts that underlie quantum computers. Um, look at what has changed since 1998, since this ISSCC, ISSCC talk, and, and um, what are the challenges that stand in the way of a large-scale machine and, and how we could overcome them. The spin that we spoke about 19 years ago, you can think of as the tiniest possible magnet a magnet that can be aligned with an external magnetic field, we would call that a spin-up state, or can be opposed to the magnetic field, the spin-down state. And in quantum physics, we denote the states of these spins uh, with funny brackets, just to you know, make sure that we understand that these are really quantum mechanical states, not just classical values. And um, by extension, if, you know, we are aware that a magnet can point not just in two directions, but a magnet can point in any arbitrary direction. In the quantum language, we will write the state of the magnet pointing in some other direction than up or down as a linear combination of up and down. We call it a superposition, and we will say that the spin is simultaneously spin up and spin down. And by extension, in the language of computation, a quantum bit where spin up, for instance, encodes zero and spin down encodes one, a quantum bit also can exist in superposition of up and down, and you might wonder if this allows you to compute in parallel. Um, but you may very well think that, you know, at this point, what am I really doing here? Am I, making, am I using complicated language to tell something very simple? After all, you know, isn't this just a classical variable uh, and an analog bit instead of a binary, or, or let's say an analog variable instead of a binary digit. Um, and that's actually not the case. And, and uh, to make this more clear, uh, let's look at the state of two or more quantum bits. 
If these were just classical analog variables, then we could use two points on a sphere to represent the state of two quantum bits, and three points on a sphere for the state of three quantum bits. But what we know from physics is that to describe the state of three quantum bits, for instance, which together can be in a linear combination, a superposition of all the states from 0, 0, 0 through 1, 1, 1, all in parallel, to describe that state, we need to specify each of the eight coefficients in front of each of the eight terms. And for four quantum bits, we need 16 coefficients to describe their state. So here is, you know, and, and then we can compute on all of these states. So here is our version of Moore's law, really. Rather than doubling the number of transistors to double the, the computational power, we add one bit to double the computational power. For every bit that we add, the computational power doubles. And in fact, to describe just the state of 50 quantum bits takes two to the 50 coefficients, complex coefficients, which is more than what fits in the memory of the largest supercomputers today. Um, it's important to realize that these coefficients are actually complex numbers. So it's also not the case that we're here just talking about probabilistic computers and, and analog coefficients that are all positive. They are complex numbers. And to see that this is important, let's look at uh, Grover's algorithm, a simple quantum algorithm, in this case applied to three quantum bits, and look at the steps that we take in this algorithm. And I will not even tell you what the problem is that this algorithm is designed to solve, but just take you through the structure. And uh, the first thing we do is to put each quantum bit in a superposition of 0 and 1, equal superpositions, so that together they are in an equal superposition of 0, 0, 0, through 1, 1, 1. And then we're going to apply um, transformations. We will manipulate the quantum states. I'll show that uh, later. In such a way that these coefficients, these amplitudes change. And we design the steps in the algorithm so that the outcome of the problem, the solution to the problem, um, is, is encoded in the state that, you know, the, the amplitude of which increases. One of the amplitudes will increase at the expense of the others. And you design the algorithm so that that amplitude, you know, goes with the number that, that gives you the answer to the problem. So here in the example, for instance, 101, the one, one amplitude gets uh, amplified and the others get extinguished. And this happens through interference. That's why you need not just positive amplitudes, you need positive and negative amplitudes. Interference so that through the various steps in the algorithm, um, positive and negative contributions uh, interfere destructively and extinguish the undesired outcomes, and constructive interference amplifies the desired outcome. So using these properties, um, we now know how to use quantum computers in principle to solve a broad range of important problems. Um, and uh, here are some examples. Um, first is in simulating, computing the behavior of molecules and materials, which, as I understand, consumes half of the public supercomputer time today. And supercomputers have a really hard time solving such problems in quantum chemistry accurately and efficiently. They can only give approximate solutions and it takes really hard work. And this type of problems actually lends itself very well to be solved both accurately and quickly on a quantum computer, which actually may have really broad application. You know, it, it can help us design better medicine. Uh, it can help us make chemical plants more efficient by understanding how chemical reactions work. Uh, maybe we can design supercom superconductors that superconduct at room temperature, uh, and so forth. Um, another class of applications is in cryptography. There is a well-known application or algorithm for factoring large numbers efficiently. And if you can do that, you can break widely used public key systems, the RSA system. And um, many other important applications are under study, uh, from machine learning to optimization problems. And, and if you want to know more, there is a whole zoo of quantum algorithms 
described um, at, at this website here. Um, so this potential led the Nobel Committee, uh, Nobel Prize Committee, a few years ago to make a pretty strong statement. Two of our colleagues in the field received the Nobel Prize in physics. And the statement by the Nobel Prize Committee is that the quantum computer may change our everyday lives in this century in the same radical way as the classical computer did in the last century. And of course, we all are aware of the enormous impact this has had. So what does it take to build such a quantum computer? You need to identify a physical system, quantum system, where you will use two levels to describe the zero and the one. Um, it needs to be a system that you can scale up so many of the quantum bits can be put together. Um, you need to initialize, be able to initialize the, the initial state, reset the state, which is not trivial in the quantum case. Um, you need to compute. And just like the NAND gate is universal for conventional electronics, there is a universal set of gates in the quantum case. It consists of, on the one hand, rotations or, or operations acting on one quantum bit at a time. And we can visualize them as rotations of the quantum state in the sphere that I've used before in combination with controlled interactions between neighboring quantum bits, where what happens to one quantum bit depends on the state of the other so that you can do conditional logic. And of course, you need access to the final state to read out the result. So this much was clear already in 1998. And let me go through some of the major advances that have happened since then. First, as a community, we have learned to build quantum bits on a chip. When you think of quantum physics, maybe first you think of atoms or ions in vacuum or photons. And we have learned to build what we call artificial atoms, structures fabricated on a semiconductor chip that show quantum mechanical behavior much like real atoms. Um, and they go from superconducting circuits containing Josephson junctions to hybrids of superconductors and semiconductors hosting so-called Majorana particles to um, electron spins or nuclear spins attached to impurities in semiconductors or in diamond to electron spins confined in quantum dots. And what you see in common for all of these is that they are fabricated with lithography. You see metal structures, metal patterns on top of substrates. And that's a good starting point for scaling up. I also want to point out that we operate these devices at very low temperature, let's say 100 millikelvin or so. Um, and, and many people ask me, is that a problem? But I would argue that if we can build a quantum computer that operates at 100 millikelvin and solves relevant problems that are otherwise simply uh, intractable, it will be worth it. So the um, implementation that I work on myself is the one shown on the top left. And let me tell you a little bit more about it. Um, what you see is a top view of uh, a structure that has a, a quantum well some 100 nanometers below the surface. And in the quantum well, electrons move around. But we are able to isolate one single electron in, in, this, in the position indicated by these three circles, one single electron in each of the three circles using the voltages applied to the gate electrodes on top. And the spin of each of these electrons will be a quantum bit for us. So that's the first advance. Before moving to the second advance, let me take a short intermezzo and, and make more concrete how we can use electrical signals to control and read out the state of individual electron spins on a chip. For the control of single spins, we apply a microwave drive, let's say a 20 gigahertz drive, to one of the gates of the quantum dot. And this will wiggle the electron back and forth around its average position. And due to the substrate properties, spin orbit coupling, this translates to an effective magnetic field acting on the spin, which, when it's resonant, with the spin uh, precession frequency can manipulate the spin. And, can, and so when you apply this microwave drive for a carefully timed duration, you will rotate the spin from the spin up state to down, which corresponds to a bit flip in the language of computation. 
And when we apply the same microwave drive for half the duration, we can prepare a superposition. Starting from zero, we take it to zero plus one. And as a function of the microwave drive, you see how the measured probability to find this spin in spin up oscillates sinusoidally. The two qubit gate requires a controlled interaction between neighboring, neighboring quantum bits. And we control it by applying a gate voltage to the gate that separates neighboring electrons or quantum dots from each other. And when we pulse it, we allow the electrons to overlap a little bit with each other, so they'll feel each other and interact. And under the right conditions, this results in an evolution of one spin at a rate that depends on the state of the other spin. So the red and blue correspond to the evolution of one spin, conditional of the other, on the other spin being either up or down. So that's the basis of conditional logic. Reading out the spin of a single electron directly is extremely difficult because of the tiny magnetic moment. But what we've learned is that we can convert this spin information to charge information and then do charge detection. And what we do is we bring the electron with the gate voltage to a condition where it's just about to leave the island, just about to leave the quantum dot, uh, but it can only do so from the uh, spin down state. If the electron is in spin up, it does not have enough energy to reach the empty states above the Fermi energy. So it will simply stay in the quantum dot. But if it is spin down, it will move out. It will leave the quantum dot, go into one of the empty states. And shortly afterwards, another electron will come in and take its place. But for the short moment in time, this quantum dot will have been empty. And while this is happening, we record the current through a charge detector. You can see the charge detector on the top and the current flowing through it. And that charge detector senses, detects directly the number of charges on our quantum dots. And so if we record a flat response, we will conclude that the spin was up. If we record a little step, we will conclude that the spin was down. And we can extend this scheme in a CCD-like fashion by moving one electron after another to the readout position to the end of the array and, and read them out. So if you, if you think about it, it's really quite remarkable that it's possible to hold on to you know, one single electron or several in a row and manipulate and read out their state. And, and similar uh, control has been demonstrated for electron and nuclei bound to impurities and, and for superconducting circuits. That was the first advance. Second advance, um, if it, it has to do with what we call coherence time, the, the lifetime of quantum states. If I put my electron spin in some arbitrary state, pointing sideways, for instance, and I look back a short while later, I will find that it has changed, it has moved, because it interacts with um, many microscopic degrees of freedom around it in the substrate. For instance, in the first experiments that we did, we used gallium arsenide substrates. And every gallium and every arsenic atom carries itself a spin, a small spin, a nuclear spin. And it interacts with the electron spin in an uncontrolled way and makes it go around. And in fact, after just 10 nanoseconds, we had lost track of where our electron spin was pointing. So in a computation, this means that you know, you're, you're accumulating errors rapidly. Um, but what we've learned recently is that by moving to silicon, that same time scale went up to a microsecond, 100 volt improvement. And colleagues at the U University of New South Wales in Sydney um, did a, same, a, a similar experiment in uh, silicon that was isotopically purified. Most of the silicon 29 atoms uh, were removed to find another factor 100 in, in extension in coherence time. So a factor of uh, 10,000 improvement just by going to a different material. These timescales can be boosted even further to fractions of a second using clever techniques to manipulate the spins. Even then, there will be some residual error rate. Um, but importantly, it's been shown that it actually is possible to correct for these remaining errors. Um, and, and it involves a process uh, that, that you know, res uses redundancy. We call it quantum error correction. It's an analog of conventional error correction. 
where the redundancy is of the form that a state up plus down is encoded in a three spin state, all up plus all down. And uh, what was shown is that with this redundancy and, and um, you know, feedback techniques, it is possible to keep the quantum states alive for as long as is needed, arbitrarily long. The requirements are that the probability of error per step are low enough. It used to be uh, that we required one, or that the threshold was at one error per 10,000 steps, which is really you know, pretty steep, pretty demanding. Uh, but in the last years, this has come down to one in 100, an error rate that you know, in many cases we achieve already. Um, the cost is the redundancy, and in the quantum case, the redundancy can be very significant, not one in three like in this example, but one in 100 or 1,000 or, or even more. So, you know, summarizing the main um, advances are we have quantum bits in CMOS compatible technology, coherence times went up by a factor of 10,000, and remaining errors can be corrected. But I would say the biggest change since 1998 is that the belief that a quantum computer, a large scale machine, can be built uh, has really grown. And that's really of the last couple of years a very special feeling, a new dynamic in our field. So with this, you know, what stops us from having this large-scale machine uh, today? Let me go through a couple of challenges, focusing on those most closely related to, to ISSCC. First is that qubits have personalities. When we fabricate a qubit sample, quantum bit sample, in our clean room at the university and begin to measure, we find that they're all, all the quantum bits behave differently in uncontrolled ways, and this really slows down our progress. To make that, you know, to explain that further, um, if we look at this image here, you see uh, two electrons, each um, uh, kept in position in the quantum well by the voltages applied to the blue gates, and then the green gate separates the two electrons from each other. These electrons are, and their properties are, are sensitive to the critical dimensions of all of these gates. They are sensitive to uh, charged impurities in the substrate in the dielectrics at the interfaces, and as we said, they're even sensitive to nuclear spins in the substrate. And so really what we require to move forward is the, the, the most reliable, clean, and uh, reproducible technology that exists. And this really means that we want to move to using state-of-the-art 300 nanometer technology. Um, and in particular, for the case of the quantum dots that I've just described, you see a lot of similarity with transistors. So we can really leverage existing technology, known processes, to move quickly. And in fact, in the course of this year, we hope to measure the first quantum dot arrays fully fabricated in a 300 millimeter fab at Intel. And, and I hope they will be better than anything we've ever had in our hands, and it will be very exciting. Second. Here is a photograph of, of one of our laboratories today. In the center, the large cylinder, is the cooling machine, the refrigerator then in, in which we cool down our, our chip, our quantum chip. And to the left and right, you see the control electronics required to manipulate and read out the quantum bits. And essentially, today, we use a 20 gigahertz, a com commercial 20 gigahertz vector source, a one giga sample per second AWG, for every qubit that we control. And, and clearly, you know, the way forward is not to stack together dozens or hundreds or thousands of these large commercial boxes. So we need a different approach. And with our engineering colleagues in Delft, we are an exploring uh, tailor-made integrated electronics, much of it designed to operate at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and, and cryogenic temperatures so that we can bring the quantum bits close to the electronics. Um, so that perhaps we can also have lower noise operation, uh, of course, at the expense of, of having restrictions on the power dissipation. Um, at 4 Kelvin and a typical refrigerator, you can afford just a few watts of dissipation. So the types of circuits and control that, that is required is shown on the right, where you have uh, an LO, um, the amplitude, which, which is mixed with analog signals to shape the amplitude and, and phase of the of the microwave signals. This is distributed to the quantum bits via multiplexers, and signals come back 
from the quantum bits uh, are routed via multiplexers to um, low noise amplifiers. Um, signals are mixed down, digitized, and then processed in an FPGA, which could also be in the cold, so that in real time, feedback signals can be sent back to the quantum bits. Um, the requirement for all of the control signals has to be connected to this accuracy threshold that I discussed before, the 1% accuracy. And you want to exceed that threshold comfortably. Um, and in practice, what it comes down to is that all of the amplitudes, phases, durations have to be controlled to within a percent. And, and this includes you know, drift, calibration, uh, noise. All of them need to be accurate to within a percent. Third, um, how do we wire up large numbers of quantum bits? Um, in conventional electronics, there are literally billions of transistors and components on memory and processor chips, but the number of pins to the outside world is just a few dozen, or up to a few thousands. In the quantum case, we require control signals and readout signals to access each and every one of the quantum bits. And in fact, in today's prototype devices, there are more pins than there are quantum bits. So how do we go about this? It's a large and important challenge that is currently un unsolved. But some of the ideas that we think uh, will be required are to bring the first layer, layer of electronics um, really close to the quantum bits. For instance, in this schematic, you have local registers of uh, quantum bits, n by n quantum bits, that are linked with quantum links, and with space in between for multiplexing electronics, allowing to bring control signals to every individual quantum bit, while having only a limited number of wires going off chip. This may be combined with ideas from DRAM, where you store voltages on capacitors and only periodically need to refresh them using bit and word lines. Um, mind you, this is again more challenging than DRAM because we're working with quantum bits and voltages that need to be precise to 1%, not just a binary value below or above a threshold. So you need to refresh um, to keep them within 1%. And, and um, furthermore, we are competing against the decoherence process. So everything needs to happen fast. We need to deliver the control signals uh, and, uh, fast compared to the time scale on which our quantum states degrade. Lastly, <clears throat> here's a schematic of what we call a quantum circuit. It's a high-level description of the steps in the quantum algorithm, where the horizontal axis is the time axis, and the five horizontal lines indicate five quantum bits, with the boxes representing operations acting on one or more of these quantum bits. So this is our description. And the question is how to translate this to the microwave bursts, the voltage pulses that eventually control the qubits. You know, it, there is a whole chain of developments needed from compilation and runtime to uh, a uh, architecture and uh, place and route questions, many steps to be taken in between, much of it wide open. Uh, but fortunately, we can at least borrow some known concepts. Here you see. Um, a recent development where a high-level quantum, open quantum language, which is essentially uh, written in C++, is compiled to some intermediate quantum assembly language, which is still platform independent, but contains specific quantum instructions, standard quantum instructions, which in turn is translated to a microcode um, that essentially has just trigger and pulse and, and read uh, commands. But again, much of what needs to be done here is, is wide open. So looking at the entire system, it's really much more than uh, the quantum bits, which is what physicists like, like me focus on. There is a whole stack that needs to come together of many layers that in many cases are in the de interdependent. So you really need a systems approach to, to tackle this problem. And you need to bring together many disciplines uh, with a big role for circuit design, architecture design, system design. And, and so here is a recent uh, photograph of our Delft uh, Intel team, 
where uh, in the front rows you will or you may recognize some familiar faces uh, to ISTCC. Um, and one of the important challenges initially has been to learn to speak each other's language. We're, it's really a multidisciplinary team, and we've, we've invested a lot in this. So where is this field going? When will we have the quantum computer? Um, I do encourage you to come to the panel session tonight where we will discuss this question further, I'm sure. But let me present to you how I look at this question. On the horizontal axis is time, vertical axis, on a large scale, the number of quantum bits. And we anticipate, you know, we're, we're now at a handful of quantum bits, up to nine quantum bits in superconducting circuits. And, and we are anticipating that we will move at least on a large scale. You know, we're not, we're not going from nine to 10 to 11. We'll go to 50 and then uh, to uh, several hundred and thousands uh, over, the, over the next years. But the question then is how many quantum bits do you need? And one side to that answer I've already given, if you have just 50 quantum bits, their complexity is beyond what any supercomputer can still harness. Um, but that's not the same as making those 50 quantum bits do something useful and solve a relevant problem. And to do that, current estimates are in the millions, depending on the error correction overhead that's involved. Um, this line of million millions, that is constantly coming down. Um, and what I anticipate is that in order to bring these two lines together on a time scale of five to 10 years, and so that we can really solve relevant problems, we will need your ideas, your contributions, your engagement. And so um, this brings me back to my title slide, uh, which is that quantum computing, I think, really is the next new challenge. In, in circuit and system design. And I hope that at least some of you um, are inspired to help us to push the boundary of computation to the limit of what nature permits. Thank you.